Well, hello, everyone. We're so excited to get this uh, webinar um, get started. We are here with the Emergency Medical Services for Children Innovation and Improvement Center, the EIIC. Today is March 19, and our webinar will be with Ryan Baker. And the topic of this webinar is Making Telehealth Work in the Emergency Departments, North Carolina Statewide Psychiatry Program, and C-STEP. Our objective for today is that our participants will be able to provide at least one example of ED relationships building opportunity in their region. I um, would like to remind everyone to please include your name, credentials, and affiliated organization in the chat. We welcome all the questions. Please just unmute and ask the question or you, we will monitor the chat as well. And with that, uh, I'd like to introduce Ryan Baker who is an administrator of the East Carolina University of C Center of Telepsychiatry, which is the home for the North Carolina Statewide Telepsychiatry Program, NC-STEP, in Greenville, North Carolina. Ryan is responsible for all financial, administrative, and operational functions within the Center of Psychiatry and NC-STEP. Currently, NC-STEP provides behavioral health services at 30 two hospitals, that's impressive, 22 adult community sites, six pediatric community sites, and one University of North Carolina system institution. Ryan has over 20 years of experience in healthcare, with at least 10 of them being at East Carolina University. During his tenure the, in the University at East Carolina University Center of Psychiatry, he has sustained record-breaking growth in patient care, community side on the community sites, and non-university financial support. Please help me welcome Ryan. Ryan, it's all yours. Thank you, Anna. And Jen, do I need to join? I've got the uh, invite to collaborate. Do I need to hit that join button? Yes. And if it's giving you any additional info, don't worry about it. It's blocking my slides. It's saying wait for presenter to start presenting. Oh, then you can just ignore that. Okay, I'll leave it. Okay. All right. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ryan Baker. I'm from East Carolina University in Greenville, North Carolina. Uh, I am about an hour east of Raleigh, Durham, uh, and about 45 minutes from the beach and about an hour and 30 minutes from the Outer Banks, which uh, I'm sure many of you are familiar with. Uh, and I am the administrator for the uh, Center for Telepsychiatry, which is home of the North Carolina Statewide Telepsychiatry Program. Next slide, please. All right, and during this presentation, please, if anyone has, I like, would like this to be interactive uh, with you all. If you have questions, please stop me along the way. Uh, Jen and the others will be watching. I'd much prefer to go down uh, any questions that you all have. I've just put some basic thoughts here on the slide, but happy to go uh, anywhere. Jen, I'm seeing where people are still saying, wait for presenter. Then I would just, you can click out of that. You can ignore it. We'll, we'll worry about it at the end. So don't worry about that. I want to, okay, I want to give a second just so everyone can see. Ah, thanks for that. Yeah, click uh, leave in the upper right hand corner. Thank you. Is everyone good now in the comments? Just want to make sure before I... Good. Okay. All right. Uh, the simple question, why? Why did the North Carolina Statewide Telepsychiatry Program start? Uh, as you would see here in the slides, 45.3% of adults in North Carolina uh, uh, that are receiving, they're receiving some type of treatment for a mental health il illness. 54.7 received no mental health illness. So these are the people that have been uh, diagnosed or have had some encounter with, with mental health needs. Uh, North Carolina ranks 33 out of 50 states and DC in providing uh, access to care. This was before our, our project started. Next slide, please. And this is the, the big, our county level. We have a hundred counties in North Carolina. Uh, as you see there, 22 out of hundred have no adult psychiatrists. And the big one that we've started to focus on lately were our growth, in, and I'll talk to him, talk about a little bit where we're growing and our opportunities to grow. 68 out of 100 counties have no child psychiatrists. 
and 13 counties have no active behavioral health provider. That's LCSW, LPC, anything along those lines, and 93 of our counties are considered health professional shortage areas. Next, please. Yep, where do you go if you don't have basic community-based behavioral health? Well, you all know this, they go to emergency departments. In 2013, as you say, 162,000 visits to our EDs. We have 108 hospitals in the state of North Carolina. Uh, in 2010, uh, about 10% emergency room visits in North Carolina with mental health disorders uh, were admitted to the hospital at twice the rate of those without. Next slide, please. All right, so how, was, how and why was NC STEP born? Well, as I showed you, the, the rate of people showing up at EDs and mental health crisis was at an astronomical rate, and the hospital association went to our legislatures and said, hey, we need help with this. And along with uh, Duke University, UNC Chapel Hill, and ourselves at East Carolina, uh, the Secretary of, uh, of Health and Human Services in North Carolina convened a group to talk about what can we do to help this, pro help this issue out. And the answer that my boss, Dr. Saeed, had was, hey, telepsychiatry. Uh, and out of that, uh, and there's a lot that went behind the behind the curtain to get this goal, this, this developed and in, in, in place, but session law 2013-360 uh, was developed and then recodified and recodified in uh, 2018. And we are permanent, uh, North Carolina statewide telepsychiatry program is permanent in the North Carolina statutes now and receives reoccurring funding from the state general assembly that is appropriated directly to our, our program. Next slide, please. In simple vision here, if an adult, if an individual is experiencing an acute behavioral health crisis, enters an emergency department or community-based site, he or she will receive timely specialized psychiatric treatment through our network of statewide uh, providers and coordinations available and appropriate clinical relevant community resources. Next slide, please. All right, this is as of December 31st. Uh, one of the mottos in our state is when uh, the, uh, the, the Tourist Bureau does this is all talking about from Murphy to Manio. Murphy is the far point on the left-hand side in Western North Carolina with a red dot. We have a location there. And Murphy is all the way to the far right with a red dot where the Outer Banks are, is located. So we cover the entire stretch of North Carolina with some portion of our program. We cover 60 counties. We're in 60 of 100 counties in North Carolina. You will notice in the middle of our state, that's where the Research Triangle part, Winston-Salem, Charlotte, we're not in those areas because that is where most, there are more resources in those areas. We focus on rural and underserved areas, but, doesn't, but that does not mean we don't provide services in uh, metropolitan areas if so requested. Next slide, please. All right, as of December 30th, and I apologize, they are doing yard work in our, outside my office right now. So if you hear some noises, it'll be gone shortly. We had some 70 degree weather here the past few days in North Carolina. So the, the grass is not growing, but the weeds are growing. So they're, they're, they're cutting them. But as of now, as she said earlier, we were at 32 hospitals. We're now at 29. So when we started this program, out of the 108 hospitals in North Carolina, we were in 76. We got requests for 76 of the hospitals. And our mission was to teach these hospitals how to do telepsychiatry. So we call that graduating. So we had some large health systems come to us and say, Hey, teach us how to do telepsychiatry, and we help them along the way. And then they already had they already had psychiatrists on board working for them, but we taught them how to do telepsychiatry. Now we're down to 29 hospitals, and most of those are critical access hospitals or rural hospitals where they have no psychiatrists or behavioral health services in their emergency department, and we provide those via our network, uh, telepsychiatry network. As you see there, over 61,000 encounters uh, since inception, uh, 57 million dollars. Uh, and savings to the state. That's unnecessary uh, hospitalizations. What we can't count, well, well, what I wish we could count, but we can't quite figure out how to quantify is the savings to law enforcement. In our state, the Sheriff's Department has to transport uh, patients to uh, mental health facilities if, if they are under IVC. Uh, I can't put a, put a dollar amount on that, but if you can talk to any sheriff, they can tell you that that is a a huge burden, uh, especially for smaller counties that have a small law enforcement presence. They might only have three officers working a shift, and one of those officers is caught up having to take someone two hours away to a facility that really has an impact on, our, on, on their uh, services they provide. 
31% of our patients have no insurance. Uh, that is going to change here in North Carolina. We did Medicaid expansion uh, that came in effect this past fall. We already are seeing an impact on that, but I'll have more data on that later on in the year. But uh, that's why another reason why this program needed to be built, because if you were a private company, just, just think you, you've got your own business and someone comes in and takes 31% of your services and pays you nothing for them, you wouldn't be able to stay in business. Uh, so that's another reason why we were so important to, to go. The community-based sites uh, started in 2018, uh, already now close to over 24,000 encounters in that, that program. Next slide, please. Uh, one of the things that Jen and the team here at, wanted me to talk about was um, how do we get started? How do you how do you build relationships with hospital partners, and and where where should you start? And the natural thing is to to obviously say the C-suite, and I would agree that that's a place to start. But my question would be uh, the my answer would be what well, depends on what your current relationship is that you have with a hospital or facility that you're looking at. Do you already have relationships with some providers there or members in the emergency department or throughout throughout the hospital? Where are your relationships that you have now? And I would develop those relationships and ask those people, who are the stakeholders that need to be involved to have this conversation about providing services to their emergency departments or whatever services you're looking to do? It, it's kind of natural to say, oh, let's start at the C-suite or at the top. And I would argue, well, through our experience, we found the best way has always has been more of a bottom-up approach, uh, starting especially with managers uh, for the ED side, ED managers or uh, administrators of emergency departments. Those are usually the people that we connect with right away that get the ball rolling for us to start a relationship with the hospital. And then we work our way up uh, to the C-suite. Uh, I've oftentimes found when we started the C-suite, it's great. It's a great place to start. But there is a disconnect sometimes there between what's going on on the floor and what's going on in the uh, as far as the perspective of the C-suite. And I don't mean that as a, as a knock against the C-suite, but they've got a lot of things they're, they're thinking about considering and they might know, not know what the true need of the ED is uh, and what they're being told. Uh, I just kind of want to couple it. Co build a coalition of stakeholders. The more people you can get involved, the better. I cannot tell you all how many times in this program we started and we thought we with a hospital, we thought we had the right people at the table. And I get to the process where I'm writing a contract and they're like, oh, wait a minute. We have such and such that needs to be involved in this as well. And that kind of gets you back to square one. Uh, those are painful lessons to learn especially if you're the one writing the contract as I have, as I do, I write our contracts. Uh, you learn very quickly to ask questions, but also know, even though you ask multiple times, they might not realize who needs to be involved in these meetings, especially if it's on a lower level, uh, a manager or, or such as that, or uh, your administrators will know, but your lower level folks, uh, they probably don't know who from the contracts department or who from senior leadership needs to be involved. And that's where C-suite value is very, very important. They can tell you from a upper level Department, hey, you need to make sure these stakeholders are at the at the table while you're talking through these details. Uh, compliance, risk. There's all types of folks that need to be at the table and, and sign off on it. I even will say uh, IT. IT can be, they're often forgot about until the last minute. You're talking about telehealth te uh, or telepsychiatry. They've got to be involved as far as the permissions to make sure that the firewalls and, and things like that can can be uh, compatible with whatever uh, devices and so forth that you can you can uh, that you're going to be working on. Those often, if those are the last ones that come to the table, those often times will be the situations where you will be delayed starting your care. Uh, so the sooner you can get the IT people involved, the better. Uh, last bullet point here: ensure there is a clear and I, I highlight a clear understanding of the problems and solutions because even within hospitals they might not have a clear understanding of what their problem and solution, what the problem and solutions are. And sometimes you will be the one getting them to the table for the first time to discuss uh, the issue that you're there to talk to them about uh, in the emergency department uh, or, or whatever issue they're going. 
And so making everyone sure everyone's on the same page and repeating that several times, sending out clear communications on emails. Uh, even though you meet with people face-to-face, -face, I would always encourage everyone to send out an email with a synopsis of what you met about and send it to the stakeholders that were there at the meeting and any of those that might have missed the meeting. Uh, next slide, please. This is big for us. Uh, identify your champions. And what I mean by that is, who is going to be a champion at your hospital or your clinic or whoever you're partnering with? And you need to have more than one. There has to be someone there, boots on the ground from that organization, who is going to see this uh, relationship through. Uh, and the reason you won't have more than one is, as you all know, Turnover is very common uh, in healthcare, especially in emergency department settings. And the more people you can have, the better. I can't tell you how many times that we have uh, we have uh, had a hospital where we had a champion, and that champion. Uh, hold on one second. I'm sorry, you all. Paul Moore's passing right by my window. Or how many times that champion left the organization and then there was no one left to pick up where we, we left off, off that. Uh, so what we did is, hey, the champions need to lead not only the, the relationship, but need to educate others in their settings about what services are available. Uh, take the plan to the C-suite with your champion. Again, that goes back to what I was talking about earlier. The, the champion needs to lead and, and as much as possible as boots on the ground. Uh, and going back to earlier, stakeholders involved, they have to be identified. You've got to have all these people at the table uh, from the beginning to make sure everything is, is in place to, to, to get the uh, project up and going. And again, ensure there's a clear understanding. There's a reason why I have that line in here twice. Uh, when you think you've given everyone a clear understanding, uh, it's time to go back and make sure again, because again, there could be turnover. There could be others coming to the table that, that weren't originally at the table that are now in. Uh, so continuing to make sure there's a clear understanding uh, for everyone to that you're on the same page and rowing the same same way. Uh, develop an action plan with accountability, and I don't mean that in a uh, in a negative way, but if we don't have a clear map of where we're going or what we're going to be doing, uh, we're not going to execute the plan that's been developed. So knowing who is in charge of what and how often they are in charge of that is a very important for this type of work. Uh, everyone's got to be held accountable and know, hey, you're assigned to do this, you're assigned to do that. And if there is a issues or concerns, you can work with someone else to help address those issues. You don't want anyone to be siloed, uh, but we also want to know what everyone's clear role is. Next slide, please. Sounds simple, but it's 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 hard work. You never stop building a relationship. Um, relationships take forever to build. I mean, well, don't take forever. Take a long time to build, but it can easily be uh, end in a second if you're not keeping those relationships um, uh, in place. So, a lesson we've learned recently is during COVID, we stopped doing our site visits. Uh, where the folks, we were going out and visiting with our partners at the hospitals and community sites. And because of COVID, we couldn't go out for obvious reasons. That had a very negative impact on relationships we had with hospitals. What I mean by that is there was turnover that took place. Uh, there were people that have left and we lost that communication with our stakeholders that we had there. We were still communicating with them via, via email or, or phone calls, but you cannot replace that that physical interaction. Go to that site, even if it's just for a few minutes, have a meeting, bring them lunch, be proactive and get a cadence with them because they will tell you what's going on with the site, what opportunities are to be uh, proactive and uh, do better. Stay in close contact. That kind of goes back to what I, what I was saying. This sounds simple, but it's true. Lack of contact with your with your folks will destroy your hard work. Uh, it happens. Turnover is happening more and more frequently. People are, are, are going from job to job or some people have retired. Uh, you've got to have those stakeholders and find, know what's going on in that, that hospital 
or in a community site and uh, what's happening in that, that uh, organization that you're working with. Uh, next slide, please. Contracts. I know this is exciting, exciting, exciting work here. There's nothing more exciting than development contracts. Uh, I myself have been, in, I've written close to 70 contracts and I despise them just as much today as I did, uh, uh, did it before. But who is your legal contact? How does your organization, it's very key to understand how your organization contract process works and how the entity that you're trying to partner with, how their contract works. And what I mean by that is, uh, like I, I work for a state agency. So we prefer to have our contracts templates to be used because we're a state and we have different language and languages than, than non-state entities. Does your organization want to be the actual contract entity? What I mean by that, who's gonna write the contract, develop the contract? My, I will say the person that writes the contract has more control as far as the, uh, what language is put in there. Uh, it is more work, but also I find as I'm writing these contracts, I have boilerplate contracts now, uh, but language that needs to be added specific to sites, there might be things that are specific to a site that, that's not specific elsewhere. You can add that language in there. And then knowing what your legal review process is, what's your organization's legal review process to review contracts? What's uh, your partner, potential partner, what is their relationship? I will tell you for me, my average contract, when I start a contract with an organization, takes about three months. Uh, and that's because there's just so much review. So you wanna have that re realistic expectation when I go talk to a hospital, potential hospital partner and say, well, hey, this is great. How quick can we get going? If everything's perfect, three months, rarely does everything go perfect. And then you talk about credentialing and other things. You're looking anywhere from three to potentially five months before you actually start once you agree to move forward. Uh, again, real, that goes back to realistic uh, timeline of execution and, and starting. Template design. Uh, yes, I see that question there. Would you be willing to share some templates? Uh, what's the rest of that question, Jen? Could you tell me? Says, uh, would you be willing to share some of those templates? Having examples that can help guide our local contracting efforts would be helpful. Absolutely, I absolutely can do that. Uh, that and that's how I learned is through through templates and and things of like that. I'm happy to share my my templates and uh, answer any questions. Uh, again, mine is specific to the state of North Carolina requirements. But what you can take from that is you can see the legal, the liability insurance, and I would take all those. The, all the topics, the headlines, and kind of tailor into what you need the specific, your legal team and your team will know what to do, but uh, there might be some things on there that would would, would help you. Uh, and that's why I say a template design. I, I have about five templates that are standard templates, and then I massage those into what the needs are for a specific, specific site. Uh, red lines. Uh, this is critical. Uh, I would encourage you all as you're writing a contract when you're doing your rough drafts to go ahead and get the other entity reviewing your rough draft. There's nothing worse than you've, you've written a contract template, you've gotten your legal to look at it, you send it over to the another or to your potential partner organization and they just bleed all over it with red lines. Uh, then you've got to go back to your legal a second time Share the contract templates among yourselves between the administrators you're talking with and the legals that, legal organizations there to minimize the number of times you have to go um, send red lines. I can tell you, after you have about four or five versions of a contract, uh, I did have hair before I started working with contracts. You will lose, you will get into version, your version control will get out, out, of, out of hand. Make sure when you're writing a contract, when you save it, version 1.1, 1.2, 1.3, have a way to track your versions. That is from experience of where I've made mistakes of not doing a good job of that. And it can be very, very painful uh, not keeping up with those red lines. Uh, next slide, please. 
contrast considerations. This is just from my experience and, and people that you might, your organization may or may not. This is from my, my side of the shop. Uh, risk, any of your risk, your, your OII, if you have one of those, uh, get those people involved from the beginning because they may have specific languages that they require to, to be in your contract templates uh, or, or things that they want to address in there. BAA, business associate agreements, uh, those are standard. You all should have a BAA with every organization uh, with that. If that's something, if someone needs an example of a BAA, I'm happy to share one of those as well. Uh, liability insurance, malpractice, your organization most likely will have already requirements in place. The organization that you're partnering with or attempt to partner with may have different uh, requirements. That needs to be discussed, discussed up front and, and defined clearly. Uh, this is the big one. Clearly defined roles and deliverables of each, of each organization. Not just what you're going to deliver, but what they are going to deliver as well. What I mean by that is uh, clearly line out what the expectations of your organization, what you're going to bring, and what your partnering organization must do. And I would do that in exhibits. We do that in exhibits. I uh, often have up to two to three exhibits. And it is laid out line by line what the expectations are of each organization. And this isn't to be... Uh, nitpicky or, or anything like that. It doesn't mean you don't trust the organization, but if it's not clearly defined in the contract, again, speaking from experience, you can have situations where there's turnover and if it's not in the contract, people say, what's well, not in the contract? We're not going to do it. Say it's as simple as you have, must provide us with patient demographics, specific patient demographics. Someone, if that's not clearly spelled in the contract, could come up and say, no, we're not going to do that anymore. It's not in the contract. Again, uh, please let our lessons and pain that we have gone through over these 10 years uh, uh, not be in vain for you all to, to learn from that. And that everything I'm saying here is from, 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 clear, from, from situations that we've had. Uh, it's better. It is, it is very tedious the first time you do one of these. But again, you will have a template and will become easier and easier each time. Also, as technology changes and your assets and roles change, those exhibits can change as well. Uh, and when you do that, you can do contract amendments. And I can go into that as well. You don't have to do a, a whole other, another contract when things change. You can do contract amendments uh, as well to this contract. Uh, the other big thing, termination uh, terms. Uh, I'll tell you what ours is. Ours is a 90-day no calls uh, clause that we have. Either organization that can give 90 days notice and there's, we can, they can pull out or we can pull out. Uh, your organization may be different. I'm sure you have guidelines at each organization on how your termination notices are, but have that conversation up front. What you don't want to happen is there not be a clear understanding of termination policy and uh, you don't want there to ever be Always think, even if a relationship is ending with an organization, there is always a potential down the road to work with that organization again, and you don't want to uh, hurt your relationship well with those, those folks. Uh, payment terms. Uh, how, how would they, uh, what are the payment terms? If there's any funds changing hands, uh, uh, have that to, uh, have that complete, completely, completely lined out and in, simple terms, is it a net 30, net 60, net 90, have those terms completely uh, uh, laid out in the contract. Next slide, please. And this is kind of my collusion, conclusion here. It, it's, it's not hard to do, do telepsychiatry, but it is hard work. It is very hard work. It is very tedious work sometimes, and you will do the same work over and over again uh, and, and say the same lines over and over again. I'm still saying some of the same things that I've been saying for five years since I've started started here. Uh, and it's just like in sales, relationships drive success. I tell, I was just in a meeting today saying, telling someone, I said, uh, I'm in the relationship business and healthcare is just a side product. Uh, if we are in the relationship building of building relationships with, with the folks that are in these organizations. Again, establish a check-in cadence. Our experience, we try to visit at least once a year in person to our, our partners across the state. 
Uh, like I showed you earlier, we all we go all the way to the mountains. I'm going. I'm actually flying out to uh, Western North Carolina next week to check in with our furthest hospital, which is an eight-hour drive here from where I sit in Greenwood, North Carolina. Uh, so making that effort to go out and see those patients if you can. Financially, that sometimes can be tough, uh, depending on what your finances are. But I would definitely, if you can budget it, budget some travel time to go see your 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 partners. Uh, proact proactivity reduces the need for be, to be reactive. Be proactive uh, as much as possible. Proactive, proactive, proactive. Ask questions uh, and try to anticipate what the needs of places will be. Uh, adapt, adjust, reinvent. Uh, that's that's what we do every day here. Uh, and stay positive. Remember that. This is one of the things that I have to remind my staff a lot of times. Stay positive. We all have a positive impact on the people in the communities we're supporting. Sometimes we're getting our silo and we have so much going on and the same things over and over again, and we get a little frustrated, but just remember that we're helping those that otherwise wouldn't have the services if we weren't there. And next slide. And that's my contact information. And I'm happy to take any questions or provide any more information. Ryan, and I apologize is, for all the noise in the background. Yes, ma'am. I just uh, had a quick question and I'm sure our um, participants will be bombarding you with questions in a second. So I wanted to steal your attention for a minute. You said that the most successful ways were for you to keep the relationships is by visiting um, once a year. What do you do during those visits when you visit the sites? Do you like preset the meetings with certain people or you go out and have a coffee? What has been successful? Great, great question. All the above. Uh, so we try to set up the meetings. I've, I've got a great support staff that helps me. I try to meet with all the stakeholders that I have relation. We have relationships with there. Uh, usually the the ED managers or the administrator. I try to see the C suite at least pick my head in there and say hello to them. But the great thing we have is we have performance measures that we capture on all of our our hospital partners, and that's what. That's how that is the gist of the meeting is, hey, we want to come share your performance measures of what we're tracking and discuss with you what opportunities for what can we do better and how can we help you more, more successful. We don't set a very rigid uh, standard uh, meeting template. Uh, again, we've been doing this so long. We know most of these people very well, but it's just like that. It's either set, bringing them lunch. Oftentimes we will bring them lunch. And that's a good way to get everyone to attend. And it's more of a, a round table. Hey, what do you think? What, what's happening out here that we don't see? And what, how can we provide this service better? And I, the face-to-face, -face, I have gotten more, uh, we have gotten more opportunities to, we have identified more opportunities, more opportunities to improve our network by those face-to-face -face than by any phone call or because you can read people's body language when they're, you know, I can tell when someone, hey, has got something on their mind and you're like, hey, no one's going to get in trouble. No one's going to get fired. Tell me what's going on. And by getting that information from that, those people, we're able to bring it back to our group. And oftentimes it's with uh, our technology, how we can make that better. Or there may be even an issue with a provider. Uh, maybe there's a provider that that one of my providers has has done something not intentionally uh, but has, you know, we can address those issues before they manifest into some, something larger than what it really is. Uh, did I answer your question, Anna? Yes, it did. Thank you so much. I was just wondering if there was a strict agenda you kept. Um, in no, the we, to, yeah, to, it's not a strict agenda. You. It's more of, hey, here's your data. Let's talk about what's going on. Uh, we do, uh, when it's our high volume partners, there's often more. There's often a more uh, itemized agenda, a more a, a more detailed agenda because they have more volume. But if I'm going to a rural hospital that say only send only provide, you know, I'm doing minimum service there. I'm out there more of helping them. Hey, or or their patients, or their opportunities for our service to be more utilized here, uh, and kind of looking at the opportunities. And oftentimes it could be that they've seen so many of our consults that the attendings in the ED are comfortable uh, with managing more of these patients than, than needing, our, needing our services. Thank you, Ryan. Hmm? 
any questions in the chat or anything from anyone? Nothing in the chat so far. Uh, and it doesn't have to be about anything I've talked about. Are there any questions from anyone? It doesn't have to be on this topic. So that any from, again, we're a statewide telepsychiatry program. Uh, happy to share any of the experiences uh, that we've, we've gone through or any questions you may have. Or if you want to know how not to do something, I can tell you that too, because we more than likely have, have done that. Uh, and that's been the most success of, as I've talked to other, that's the thing that I, that we're most proud of is we're helping other states. We're, uh, we're helping Oklahoma State University get a, get a program up and going. And they've been able to take from the lessons we have learned. And, and uh, that's just real rewarding to see that our work here is, is being taken to other states. Ryan, if we have some uh, folks here who are just beginning to connect with EDs, um, mm -hmm. as far as partnerships, where would you recommend to start um, if they don't have anybody, particularly in C-suite or other places in the ED or other hospital? Um, are there connectors there in the community that keep that relationships alive all the time that people can reach out to? Yes, they should, depending on how large the hospital is, uh, they should have, the hospital should have a community liaison or uh, somewhat, I, I, an email always works. Uh, I, that's oftentimes what we've, what I've done is uh, send a cold email to an administrator of emergency department or uh, a, le a senior leader. I'll go on the hospital website and find out, okay, who is, whoever I'm looking to talk to, if it's pediatrics, uh, who, who is in charge of pediatrics, uh, X, Y, Z, sending them an email, uh, telling them who you are and what you're looking to do. Uh, that is in not just one person, uh, copy several people on, because what you'll find is, or what I found is they might not be the one that that's, that's, involved in this, but 99% of the time, they're going to forward your email to the person that, that it is, uh, that is involved and just uh, picking up the phone and calling. Um, the big thing is, remember, you, they're already, they're more than likely already talking about this inside their hospital. That's what I found many times. Oh, we were just talking about this the other day. I'm like, well, this is our program and setting up a more formal meeting uh, with them. Uh, people in your community, uh, if you have a chamber of commerce in your community, believe it or not, that is a real good place to start to get an invite to get to get uh, introduction to a someone within the or within a hospital organization that can get you in front of the right people. Uh, your chamber of commerce uh, is a great they they have a connection. If you have a chamber of commerce in your town or whatever hospital or whatever, whatever hospital you're looking to reach, their chamber of commerce will have a relationship or know who to contact as far as uh, who you should talk to. Uh, Chamber is a, a great way to, uh, and it doesn't mean you have to be a member, but you could be, you could be reaching out to, uh, you can reach out to a chamber in a different city. They will answer your email or your phone call and will connect you because that is part of uh, their mission of Chamber of Commerce is, is bringing resources to their, to their community. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm not seeing any questions in the chat. Does anyone have a question? Would like to unmute and ask the question? This is Jen, I was gonna jump in. So once you kind of had that captive audience and you've begun those conversations, I think a big piece and kind of going back to Anna's point, some of our teams are still kind of in those early phases of figuring out, you know, what they're able to offer doesn't meet the needs of the ED. Um, have you experienced any kind of like dissonance between like, hey, this is the service we offer and maybe hearing from the ED that they're like, I don't know if we need that or I think we need this and not that. Absolutely. Uh, one size does not fit, fit all. Uh, that is for sure. Uh, and I think that's depending on what you're trying to build. Uh, you can be, do you want to be strict about we're only doing this or that? Like, uh, Jen, you've heard me say this kind of our rule is we have two ditches on each side and I have a lot of latitude between, I have rules that I can't go outside of and my rules are set by the state legislature. So it's a little bit different, but more than if, if someone has a need and 
it's a rock around our services. I'm, we're going to find a way to meet that need. And oftentimes they don't know what their actual need is. Uh, so that's part of, of what both of you, both organizations are learning. All right, like what can I do and what is the actual need there? Uh, that can be very difficult, but it's having those conversations and saying, look, this is what we're thinking as far as uh, telehealth or whatever it is, what is your need? And just talking through that uh, once that ball starts rolling, it will snowball and it will pick up tremendously and it, and it will go. But don't be afraid to explore an outside the box alternative if it's within your 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 realm of what scope of what you're you're allowed to do. Uh, you will learn a lot and you will adapt and you can change that. Uh, once you've partnered with one hospital, you've partnered with one hospital. Each hospital will be a little bit different. And every hospital will tell you that their situation is different. It doesn't matter who you talk with. We're different than other hospitals. Out of the 70 some that I've been involved with, I can tell you they all have around the basic problems, how they got to that problem, or there might be some ancillary things that are a little different, but they basically have the same problem with, uh, with the services, uh, well, for me, for mental health services for kids and, and adults. And how can you assist that? So the, the base problem is the same as how we're going to solve that problem. It's just all ancillary. And we, you can figure that out from there. So, um, yes, reinventing, changing, adapting. Uh, and your leadership also within your organization has got, got to understand that as well. Uh, and your hospitals, let's call them the customers, will tell you what they need. It might not be word for word, but if you will listen They'll tell you what they need, and you can develop a solution to bring to bring to them to, to help them out. No idea is a bad idea. That's the other thing is, I mean, that's one of the things people are afraid of is, I don't want to be, you know, I don't want to say something that, don't worry about it. I mean, it's a new world for everyone, especially post-COVID. Uh, we're all searching for, for ways to provide better care, and you're, you're bringing an opportunity to them. For sure. Denise, I saw your hand was up. Yes, thank you, Jen. And thank you, Ryan, for, for presenting, like just painting the picture of what NC Step is, is up to. So thank you for, for bringing the content to us. One of the questions I had uh, is, is going to touch on one of your more recent points related to the, the diversity among the, the hospitals. I, I imagine different hospitals have different needs and and you, you may have, I imagine your team has like a clear programming that could in fact be beneficial to said hospitals. But I'm, I'm curious about like the educational offerings that are provided. Are there, I, I admire and appreciate like you saying that, you know, like you want to individualize um, the offerings because the needs vary. But are there any standard um, educational offerings that you, you know, like plan to offer the hospitals upon onset? Because I imagine, you know, there's, there are some, some guidelines related to that. So I'm just curious. Yes, yes. And so I'm, a couple, I'm gonna go a couple of different ways with you on this. Okay. Uh, first is just educating them on what our services are and what we can do. And more importantly, what we can't do. Now, mm -hmm. in our program, we are a consult service only we make recommendations to the EDs. Uh, we don't write, we don't manage patients. And that's just, we wish we could, but if we did that, we would, we, we just couldn't manage that, that situation is setting those expectations up with the staff. So when you, uh, when we develop a partnership or start a contract with a hospital, before we ever go live, my team goes on site several times to sit down with, the nurses, the ED staff, and others to clearly line out what the what this program is, and more importantly, importantly, what this program is not. We are not the save all, and we are we are just. This is what the expect setting those expectations. This is what we can do, and one of the beautiful things that happens as far as education is, as easy, as we start doing consults with the site after a. ED physician has seen the same diagnosis seven or eight times and has seen the recommendation seven or eight times, 
he or she gets more comfortable seeing that diagnosis. And we actually see our referrals drop off a little bit because after they've seen that diagnosis, because they're getting the recommendations back from my, my uh, psychiatrist uh, to them. So we're, we're making recommendations. Oftentimes it's uh, med recommendations uh, while the patient's being held until a bed can come op open, or it could be a child that's came in uh, uh, acting out or, or things of that, and they can make some med recommendations until the, the patient, help the patient get discharged until they can be seen uh, in that, uh, in their, in a practice there. Education wise, flipping it back, we do a lot of education on technology. You would not, teaching, the how to utilize a technology. What I mean by that is we have our own EMR just for this program because we work with so many different hospitals. We had to build our own EMR to talk to each other. We do a lot of education on that. That education never stops because you have uh, you have uh, weekend option people. You have PNR folks come through. We're always educating. We've built uh, we have built training videos for that aspect so they can watch a video in real time about that. But your, ed your question about educating providers and others, that is the next step of what we're working on right now is how do we provide ongoing education? And what I see us doing is taking what we're doing with technology and creating some videos and having that available for not only for not just physicians, but the LCSWs and social workers that work in those EDs and the other staff that, that work in those EDs because we need to help develop them, let them know what resources are in the communities that they can, can connect patients to. They'll know in their immediate area, but we might know some statewide resources that they're not aware of that they can connect these, these patients with. So that's an ongoing educational component. Uh, we also have residents at our medical school who uh, shadow in this as well. If any of you have a resident program or, or work with learners, I would highly in, uh, encourage you to engage them in with the work you're doing. That's a part of uh, not only residents, but uh, if you have a social work school or uh, psychology, anything like that, help do well workforce development. Get them exposed to this type of work. The last two LCSWs I have hired from my organization were homegrown. They literally went to our social work school here. Uh, mm -hmm. got their hours and they now work for us. Uh, like they know uh, nothing else but NC State. They work. Same thing, same thing with our psychiatrist. My medical director did her residency here at our university. And now it's mm -hmm. a grow your own talent pool. Did I answer your question with that? Definitely, definitely. And I, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm uh, one of the co-directors of the NC PAL program and we oh, are yeah, yeah, yeah. we so we're we're hoping to talk to you soon um but the uh one of the things that's been a, a priority for us is workforce development for sure and and we've been really creative around um offering a variety of learning opportunities for folks but we have also found a lot of success with uh, some video snippets that we were able to do. They're short and, you know, for those that don't have the 45 minutes hour to engage an opportunity, like, hey, check out this seven minute video. Yep. <laughs> it's, we it's it's like you five minutes or so. And uh, yeah, yeah. My, my boss is Dr. Sai Saeed, and I know he's been talking to to some of your team up there as yes. well. About, yes. about that. There is some synergy there and there's a lot of work that we can... And that's one thing, and I'll tell you all that as well, when you're working with your partners across the state, we're not in, you're not in competition with anyone else. Doing right. this. There is enough work for everyone to do in all these states. So <laughs> yeah. it's like NC PAL, what, what, uh, what Lisa's talking about is, you know, that's a, that's a, a, a line where, where, our provide, where providers can call up and get some help right away. That's a great compliment to what we do. I mean, the more mm -hmm. resources, the better. This isn't a competition. And sometimes you will find turf, turf, if, when people don't know about you, it's, it's kind of natural to think the worst, hey, they're trying to encroach on our turf, uh, but have those conversations and build relationships and partnerships uh, with others that are doing other work across your communities. Uh, thank you, Ryan. Yeah, well, we'll be in touch. We'll yes, be in touch. <laughs> okay.
It looks like we got a question in the chat. So following up with the last questions and statement, Nebraska's PMHC program is run by our Department of Health and Human Services. Do you recommend to have one of our universities join our team? I would, uh, Matt. Well, let, let me. Yes, uh, and that's. Uh, I'm going to say yes without knowing what the when I say political when I, I'm talking about university politics uh, can sometimes. But if you have a partner or a hot or a university system that it's a that's a medical. Uh, school, I would highly suggest you reach out to those folks. And let me back up and tell you one thing I didn't say is Department of Mental Health, uh, DHHS, Office of Rural Health, is my banker. They I report not only to the university, but I report to them as well. Develop a very strong relationship with your Department of Health and Human Services in your state, especially your Office of Rural Health, if that's an area where you're, you're trying to work on uh, developing. Uh, they have they can have they can introduce you to stakeholders. They have a better picture of what's going around going on across the state. The big thing they can help you with is let you know when other grant opportunities are coming available uh, that may be beneficial to your your to your organization. But yes, I would develop relationships with universities. And when I get let me kind of get back to my comment about uh, the politics of it. Sometimes in academia, things can run slower than we would like to. So I would be mindful of that as you go, who you pick, you're going to work with. If you're going to work with a, uh, a state university, they, they will be great partners, but just know they're made, they move a little slower than if you were working with a private university or, or other entities as well. But again, getting those learners from that university involved in what you're doing, not only is a workforce development, it also could be a workforce for you to use to develop your program as well. Thank you for that. Um, hello, and Gabriella from Nebraska. I wanted to also ask, um, when it comes to developing um, the program, we're in the very beginning stages. So mm -hmm. we're trying to recruit um, organizations and such to join us. Um, my question was how to um, present the program and itself to have people join us um, because I feel like because I am new to um, the Department of Health and Human Services, not everyone knows me. Mm -hmm. And so I want to make sure that I present it well and also um, to keep, you know, doors open and such. So How about I, sh I share with you one of our presentations, like what we do? I, would that help help you if I send you like how we do it? Uh, yes. It, yeah. It's just the it's it's a basic. Uh, Jen, if you can make a note for me to send send her one of our presentations, that's the easiest way for me to tell you uh, is uh, a, like a quick slide deck. That's the quick who, who what, when, where, who, what, when, where, how type thing. Mm -hmm. uh, and you've got to get comfortable. Gabrielle, you're you're not aggravating people. You're on a mission to help people. And that you got to keep that mindset when you're emailing people and you're reaching out to them, because what is it? I think this research says it takes seven, seven or nine times for someone to finally acknowledge what you're what you're sending them. Mm -hmm. you've got, I would say my advice to you, with anything is make sure your mindset is right that, hey, it's going to take you multiple times to get people engaged. Go to those meetings that are with your. So you work in DHHS. Is that yes. right? Yeah, Go we're in the, the Division of Public Health. So, yeah. Uh, do you have an office of rural health there as well in your state? We do, but a lot of our um, people are retiring or moving to other positions. So, so we're in that. that. That's actually perfect. Because you know what that means? There's new people coming in that won't know the status quo way of thing, how things were done before. So Gabriella gets to be the one saying, hey, here's the future. I, I, I think that's a, you've got a huge opportunity with, with a turnover happening in there to set the stage of what you would like, what you can do and what you can develop uh, with that. So I, I would change my, my mindset of, hey, that's a great opportunity to, to get in front of these folks and to, uh, to uh, educate them as much as possible. But I'll share one of our little slides of, that we do, and that can be kind of a guide for you to develop your own, some talking points or how to get the conversation going. Because once you start that conversation, it'll keep going. 
Thank you. Brian, he, you are so full of um, advices and energy, and we really enjoyed this presentation. So at this juncture, we are four minutes away from um, finishing up. We would like uh, for all to please complete the evaluation. Um, I think there's one or two questions either going to be in the chat or through a Mentimeter. Jen will direct us in the, in the, in the minute. Um, I do wanted to say that we will actually, you're going to all who came today will receive a follow up email from Hana from the EIC. We will share the um, earlier requested um, forms. I think it was contracts from for EDs. Ryan, did I get that right? Um, we had a ask earlier in the, yes, in the discussion. Yes, yes so we will include those if with Ryan's permission as a follow-up, as well as this presentation with Ryan's information on it. Um, we will also um, reply to Gabriella with the um, slides that Ryan will provide. Thank you for coming to this webinar. Really appreciate all the questions and engagement. Um, if you haven't put in the chat your organization, please do so now so we don't lose your information and your contacts. Um, quick reminder, on March 26, which will be next Tuesday, I believe, we have an um, office hours where we will talk a little bit about application of the toolkit that is created for teams that are expanding to um, emergency spaces in, in their states. Um, and we will uh, have, so it's a, it's a two hour um, office hour. So it's three to five and at, five, and at four o'clock we'll, we'll have a data analyst come and talk about um, uh, data basics and um, uh, how do you, you define nominators and denominators. If this is something you'd like to learn, please join us um, at that time. Uh, we will also have another office hour on May 2nd. Um, and this is where we will discuss different uh, um, uh, ways of evaluating data software uh, platforms and considerations one should um, think through uh, before we go beyond just Excel spreadsheet. Uh, with that, um, uh, um, do remember to register for those events. That's on our website, and our website is uh, in the presentation here, but also I've been seeing it's been dropped in the chat. Um, I'm going to um, hand it off to my colleague, Jen, and see if we forgot anything. Nope, I think you're good. So evaluation time. Um, again, if your Mentimeter thing is not working, you can also join at menti.com using this code. Um, it's really just one question we want to hear from you. So do you